Thank you and good morning. Uh, before I get started, I, I think uh, Brittany deserves a round of applause for the amazing work that she does. I, I also want to acknowledge Rita Troyer, who um, originally asked me to participate uh, and to do this talk, who uh, was the person who brought Creative Mornings to Indianapolis and had the vision to do that. And then to her and the rest of the teams, everyone who's been involved with Creative Mornings, this is a really, uh, I think, a really powerful and important thing for our city to be doing. So I thank you for, uh, thank Rita and Brittany and everyone else who's been a part of that. And, um, you know, hope that you guys will, will encourage them to continue to do so and find ways to support them. This morning, uh, that's Arial font, by the way, for the designers in the house. <coughs> it's the first in the alphabet. Um, so uh, I could probably just go back and reread the mission statement and it would pretty much summarize my talk and particularly the first point and the last point that everyone is creative and everyone is welcome. Um, but I'm gonna unpack that a little bit more obviously because that's what I've been asked to do. And so I have your attention for 20 minutes plus Q&A. So I am going to use those 20 minutes. This, um, this is a challenging subject for me to speak on. And so you can already hear my voice wavering. <laughs> um, and so I'm gonna get out of the way. I'm gonna get the tears and the crying out right now so that I can go through and give my talk. This is a very, very uh, uh, personal story for me. And so today, I hope you will empathize with me and joining me in this story. And my talk today is about how punk prepared me for Down syndrome and chronic disease. I promise I won't waver the whole time. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. And so it will, it adds to it. Did you ever do like a youth lock-in when you were in high school? And like they make you stay up all night which is this chemistry for losing your mind um, and being emotional in front of every single cute girl that you like. And then, then the next week at school, everyone acts like it didn't happen, but everyone knows it did. So, so I want to stretch you into some new places, uh, some uncomfortable places. I believe that discomfort is a, is a critical force in our development towards both personal and collective maturity. I believe it expands our ability to extend mercy and kindness, joy and radical hospitality to those around and beyond us. I hope you'll join me in this, this discomfort. So today, as the slide says, my story is about punk, uh, and, and I wanna unpack that for you and, and tell you my, my story. But the story starts with the story of my noise band, uh, therefore. In 1997, I was in college then, so I'm realizing I'm aging. Uh, on Father's Day of my junior year in college, I started a band with my friend Wayne. At the beginning, we probably spent more time theorizing about music than actually playing it. The name, therefore, denoted that we wanted to create music that existed between two moments or two ideas. Music that created awareness more to the things around it than to itself. We wanted to create music that existed in the elusive, ever-present moment. We believe that all music is imperfect. You can never really create the same piece of music because the context is always changing. So even the same piece of music on the same record, on the same sound system, in the same room, the same volume, a person's emotional state, their breathing pattern, even the humidity in the room can affect the way that that piece of music is heard. But we also believe that this imperfection was a good thing. I suppose that was in part because we weren't actually trained musicians, so claiming imperfection was a strategy. Uh, but but we, uh, we liked this idea that we were playing at music. We wanted to create a kind of music that was a meditation on this imperfection, a celebration of the loose boundaries between sound, music, and noise. Others felt that we were hitting this mark of imperfection perfectly. Grail Marcus, author of some of punk rock's most important writings, inclu including the seminal Lipstick Traces, 
when, asked, when we asked him what he thought about our music, he simply stated, I don't like it. Miranda July, experimental filmmaker, musician, and artist, walked into one of our performances and immediately turned around to leave. Pitchfork, tastemakers of the free world, yes, gave our third album a 1.2 on a scale of 10. And John Darnell, the Mountain Goats, on his blog, Last Plane to Jakarta, said we had the worst band name ever. However, to be fair, he did go on to write a lovely eight-page review of one of our releases. None of this fazed us, of course. We believed in what we were doing. And while we may not have been playing in a particular category, style, or genre of music, not even obeying the rules of noise music, which in fact there are rules, we played with fierce intentionality. For us, our music was a deep communication and a place into which we could enter into a shared mindfulness. We performed very long shows. We played a 30-hour show, a 22-hour show, a 12-hour show, and several eight-hour shows. The idea wasn't endurance. The idea was access. These free shows were designed to allow people to create their own experience, to come and go as they pleased. We produced over 500 unique free one-of-a-kind cassettes, which we distributed on the street. So we have a pretty extensive catalog, over 500 albums. We were, all, this was, we were doing this in the hope to make music for the masses and uh, to create non-antagonistic and non-commodified experimentalism. However, there were some people outside of the masses, maybe more of the, uh, the privileged masses, that we also managed to get our cassettes into the hands of, which was Robert Rauschenberg, Lori Anderson, Robert Thurman, who's Uma's dad, and uh, this woman, Sharon Stone. Yes, she has a Therefore cassette, although she only had it very briefly because I imagine she threw it out on her way out the door. We sold, we sold uh, one of our CDs for an hour's wage, so whatever you made in an hour is what we asked you to pay for it. It was a progressively priced product. Unfortunately, we didn't manage to sell one to her. We consider ourselves a punk band, not punk rock stylistically, but rooted in a punk ethos and ideology that we saw as a method to disrupt the status quo, a tool to create cognitive dissonance, and a disobedience or disruption as a means to question the social, political, and cultural hierarchies of the moment. People often associate punk with youth culture and rebellion. As you're coming to age, you begin to see the challenges and hypocrisies of society in your school, your family, your neighborhood, your country, your world, yourself. Punk is the soundtrack to these realizations. I want to never lose touch of that adolescent rage and frustration, hence why I'm wearing Vans. No, that has nothing to do with why I'm wearing Vans. They're just really comfortable. Um, but instead of being channeled, that frustration and that rage being channeled into sort of a nihilistic destruction, I want, it to, I want to harness it for a healthy questioning of authority and an unrelenting thirst for mercy. I want it to convict, convict and compel me to do the hard work of giving voice to the voiceless. Our definition of punk wasn't tied to such bands as the Sex Pistols, the Ramones, or Black Flag that are often associated with this youthful rebellion. Rather, our punk story is one that traces a long history of artists, musicians, writers, social activists, comedians, even a few politicians. Marcel Duchamp, Harriet Tubman, Moondog, Iggy Pop, Kathleen Hanna, Jean Tinglay, Jessica Stockholder, Sun Ra, Andy Kaufman, Rosa Parks, John Steinbeck, Chuck D, Emily Dickinson, Judith Scott, Herbie Hancock, Ram LZ, Frida Kahlo, Kurt Vonnegut, Africa Mabata, Bree Newsome, Jorge Luis Borges, Helen Keller, Miles Davis, Stephen Hawking, Desi Arnaz, Maya Angelou, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, Cool Herc, Madeline L. Ingle, Neil Hamburger, Yoko Ono, Hank Aaron, Philip K. Dick, Serena Williams, Chris Burke, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Kaita Takahashi, Zaha Hadid, Buckminster Fuller, Andre Tarkovsky, Malala Yousafzai, Ikue Mori, John Cage, Tig Nataro, Lee Scratch Perry, Meredith Monk, Ai Weiwei, and Pope Francis. 
We spent 12 years committed to redefine beauty, or at least expand its definition. We were committed to enriching our listeners' experience of the world around them. We wanted to disrupt assumptions about music and the business of music, to train others to be more thoughtful listeners and consumers. These ideas continue to permeate my life and work. Overlapping my 12 years as part of Therefore, I ran a record label called Asthmatic Kitty Records. While it was my job to professionally manage the label, run it as a business and attempt to turn a profit, I still worked to be thoughtful in my approach, both the way we structured our business and promoted our brand. Again, I was interested in challenging others to pause and rethink the things we often take for granted. Perhaps my favorite example of this is when we jokingly and maybe convincingly started charging a jukebox record based on the score it had received on Pitchfork. This was payback for me, actually, is what it was. We called it critic-based pricing. Our goal was to raise questions how we give value to something, to question the authority voices that were defining the worth of a record, be it its numerical score in a popular music review site or what the economy says it's worth. Cost and value, however, are two different things. I ran Asthmatic Kitty as performance art. It came out of my practice with Therefore and my background in experimental and conceptual art. The most influential artist on my approach and practice was Alan Capro, pictured here. Known as the founder of The Happenings, Capro developed an art theory rooted in the idea of the blurring of art and life. This led me to a desire not to live a life of art, but to rather artfully live. Sorry. Then my second son was born with an extra chromosome. I'm sorry, <laughs> I thought I could do this. Uh, this is my son Atlas at age one. He is now nine in the second grade. Atlas was born with Down syndrome and completely unrelated to the Down syndrome, he was also born with severe hemophilia, which prevents his blood from naturally clotting. Hemophilia is a chronic disease and genetic disorder that requires weekly infusions. Atlas had heart surgery at five months of age, but otherwise has a very rich and full life. We named him Atlas before he was born, but realized very quickly that we couldn't have picked a better name as he carries the weight of the world on his shoulders. Let's be honest, no amount of experimental art and music can prepare you for that experience. Both the sorrow and beauty, the tears and the joy, and while this entire talk or entire series of talks could be about what my sons have taught me, my years of experimenting with sound and embracing a punk ethos did provide me with intellectual and emotional tools to process and understand this new reality. I don't think anyone can teach empathy, but perhaps I can provide you an opportunity to empathize with me. I hope that by making myself vulnerable, you can enter into that vulnerability with me. This is empathy, making ourselves vulnerable alongside others during their moments of vulnerability. Atlas, by his nature, is a cultural disruption. He is a stranger in a strange land. Atlas challenges our notions of health and success and beauty and value. And I couldn't be more grateful for the opportunity to have him and my other son in my life. And for them to be continually challenging, to be continually disrupting my expectations. Before Atlas was born, another principle interests me and still does is something I call horizontal aesthetics. Often in art theory and practice, there is an aesthetic hierarchy that defines what is understood to be an aesthetic arrival, be it a measure of a work's poignancy or beauty 
or intellectual sophistication or market value. We often measure history as a progression to a greater, more sophisticated version of ourself and humanity. And while there are many ways we are progressing, you don't have to look very far to see where the opposite is true as well. And sometimes we come to learn that what we once understood to be progress is far from it. This is one of the best shows ever, by the way. Before punk, rock and roll fought against the stylistic hierarchy in music. Other examples include the division between what people call high art and lowbrow. Another example is the social ladder of high school. If your school was like mine, there was a hierarchy of who was in and who was out, and to what degree you were in or out. Again, punk and other forms of radical art and culture seek to disrupt these hierarchies to dismantle them. The point isn't to erase differences, to replace one hierarchy with another. Rather, it's to lay a vertical hierarchy on its side and create a horizontal geography of tastes and differences. So instead of looking at the high school cafeteria as a social ladder, we see it as a collection of special interest groups. Punk seeks to liberate the disenfranchised from the oppressiveness of vertical hierarchies, from any singular authority that claims ownership of beauty, success, and truth. By seeking to disrupt and dismantle it, it expands our definitions and moves us to a greater inclusivity. But not only does punk, I'm sorry, not only does punk seek to dismantle these hierarchies, it also seeks to complicate homogenization. Down syndrome also disrupts homogenization. And just as in nature, an ecosystem is healthier when it is biodiverse, so too culture and society are healthier with diversity present in all of its great variety. I'm not suggesting we don't still seek to progress, to improve and strive for greatness. We still challenge both of our sons to learn and grow. With Atlas, we make medical interventions to improve his health and support his cognitive development. We put orthotics on his feet. We take him to physical, occupational, and speech therapy. We are doing our best to shape him and form him in such a way that he can more easily navigate the world around him. It is this battle that fuels our nurture for our children, that we want them not only to survive, but to thrive in the world they are entering. We want them to be the best version of themselves they can be, as opposed to conforming to the middle or being judged and excluded by arbitrary systems for measuring their worth. I'm not satisfied with the world my children are entering. It still harbors many cruel boundaries and limits that emerge from intolerance and impatience and fear. But that is because we all have special needs. A growth in our ability to empathize as a culture and society will help us break free from our inhibitions to press into discomfort and vulnerability, our own and that of others. Again, I look to art and music to grow this collective empathy. Can a flat and wide definition of art increase our empathy and inclusion of others? Can it train our eyes to see beauty and value in every individual, not just those that meet a particular cultural norm, standard, or functional ability? I believe we all speak a different language. We are never truly able to communicate in some pure form that isn't being filtered through the complexity of our own definitions, individual experiences, and interpretations. So we gather those around us, that speak the most like us. We create a tribe that shares a common vernacular. But what if we continually challenge ourselves to learn new languages? Not necessarily in the literal sense, though that would be great too, but in being willing to step into confusion for the sake of building bridges between our various cultures, for, to, for to the ability to share experiences together with those different than us, and for the creation of a new hybrid vocabulary. Again, how can, we, how can new ways of seeing move us to new ways of being and move us towards bold humility 
and gracious action. While we, need, we still need shared definitions and agreed upon systems of measurement to cohabitate our planet and to carry out the commerce of our society, we should question any system that is either intentionally or unintentionally designed to exclude or harm others. Let's use the example of a doorknob. And some of you have heard me use this, this metaphor before, but a doorknob is designed for the average human user. It's designed for the mean. It assumes that people using this have at least full use of one arm and a hand to grab the knob, grip it, turn it, push or pull the door open. And this isn't the actual handle I want to refer to, but this is a, a, a good uh, replacement. This is very telling that when I, I typed into Google vertical push handles, I couldn't actually find handles that, that uh, actually do this well. I mean, there are some, but you can't find them on Google. You can find plenty of doorknobs on Google. But a vertical push handle is when you put pressure on the vertical handle and the door opens, all right? Does that make sense? So that's what this is representing. This vertical handle provides more points of access for a greater spectrum of users. There are movements within design that explore these principles and are working to create more inclusive environments by making design choices that support a, a wider variety of end users. I refer to this as designing for the spectrum and not the mean. Some designers are beginning to think about sensory conditions, as often found in individuals on the autism spectrum, and are designing spaces that can otherwise be abrasive sensory environments. But it's not just about doorknobs and quiet spaces. How can we apply this concept to the various roles and jobs we all represent? And how can we shift our thinking from designing not just for the sake of accessibility, but instead understanding that the principles and applications of inclusive design create more hospitable and inviting experiences for all? I'm excited to discover what the new lessons my sons will teach me in the days, months, and years to come. I learn from the incredible gentleness and patience Atlas's older brother Moses displays on a daily basis. I learn from Atlas's unceasing desire <laughs> to gather everyone in the room for frequent group hugs. I learn from their unceasing love for each other and the way they work to understand and love each other despite their differences. They teach me that empathy flattens oppressive paradigms. Empathy is what can heal divides, not only in the lunchroom, but in our society. Could we become a city that is a disruption on both a national and international scale by our full adoption of a culture of empathy and embrace? Could we become recognized as a community that builds and defines our culture as one that supports each other across the spectrum to be the best versions of ourselves? How do we move beyond courteous hospitality to courageous inclusivity? Let's look and listen for the excluded and the disenfranchised and find ways to help give their voice a platform and a power. Let's build for the spectrum, not for the mean. Let's embrace empathy as a way to remove the false barriers and hierarchies we have constructed. Let's invite others, both like and unlike ourselves, into conversation so that together we can experience life more fully with greater humility, generosity, and wonder-filled complexity. I want to end with a brief story about another punk band. <clears throat> this one from Helsinki. Perte Korokin Nimbi Pivot, don't judge my Finnish, um, or otherwise known as PKN, which is much easier to say, was founded in 2009. They gained cult status in the hardcore punk scene. This year they represented Finland in the prestigious Eurovision Song Awards, making all the way to the semifinals. But what makes this band unique <laughs> is that each of its members are differently abled and two of them have Down syndrome. Punk is the megaphone for their voice against a culture that too often marginalizes them. They found something in punk. As their basis said, punk is like a family. It didn't discriminate against us. 
Well, I welcome you to be a part of my family. Thank you for your time, and thank you for listening. Well, I think first and foremost, I mean, it goes back to being willing to put yourself in situations that are outside of your comfort zone because you begin to see what other people are dealing with and navigating the world around them. And so um, I'm really excited that Art Mix is here today because that's an organization that is empowering people through art and music to have a voice. Um, and, and so I think being aware of those populations, um, we, you know, we're, we're a tribe here this morning, right? We, we have access to the information about Creative Mornings. We, we're sort of involved in designs in the arts or at least interested in it and creativity. So I think it really is putting yourself out of your comfort zone, being willing to meet people different than yourself, and you then begin to see the challenges and to see the, the various ways in which they need to navigate the world. Um, as far as specific design implications, I mean, there's really incredible research and work being done, thinking about you know, going beyond you know, ADA accessibility. The, the, it's, it's becoming more of thinking about you know, user-centered design, but making sure that user-centered design is thinking about all users. And I, I, I get the complexity of the world that you know, there's gonna be times where you just can't put an elevator in every building or you can't have in an existing building or you can't build a ramp or whatever that, that's not the point. I think that people you know, are losing the forest for the trees in that and because I, there's so much deeper and so many more ways we can be thinking about breaking down those barriers. Again, I, th I think it's exposing yourself to new ideas and new thoughts and being like, you know, it's, 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 it's reading broadly. It's, it's, it's not getting sucked into the feedback loop of your Facebook feed. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, going to something that you never thought you, you were welcome at or should go to and showing up. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's being sensitive to um, sometimes things that look like, I, I think being very aware of disruptions. Um, and, and, and taking a moment and trying to understand why it's a disruption, both for yourself or for society. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question. That, um, so that's a tip, that's a, that is, that's, that's the hard, that's one of a very hard question. Uh, so, and I thought a lot about this. No, no, thank you. Uh, for me, for me, um, yeah, because I don't want you to take away from this that this sort of relative mush, um, because I think there's a danger in that, honestly. I had a, I had a very progressive, uh, really great poetry professor in college who said, don't be so open-minded, your brains fall out. And, and, you know, I don't know, you can interpret that however you want. But, but I, think, I, think the, I think we need to rethink the purpose of our criticism and, and the intention of our criticism. And I, I really am into this idea of, of, of contextual criticism. And really, really evaluating something based on, um, and this is a very anti-postmodern view because you know you're not supposed to read into the intentionality of an artist when evaluating piece or whatever. But I think you have to begin to think, okay, what what was the goal here? What's the context here? I mean, looking at a piece of art in a museum is a context versus looking at a piece of art in someone's home versus you know a, a piece of art that's intended for the public space. You know, there's all these different context and layers of context. There's the social, political, cultural, historical, individual context that need to be thought through and need to be considered. And so I think criticism is very healthy. I actually think criticism is something that we don't do very well here in India and we haven't done enough of. Um, but, but there's a difference between being critical and challenging people and just being mean-spirited. Um, and, and then also using criticism as a tool to exclude or to create uh, boundaries to keep people out of a discourse because there's a pretentiousness or an assumption that people won't understand. Um, yeah, there you go. I, I think this. I think context applies there too. I mean, I think in design, um, in some ways, the beauty of design is. I think design is more focused on the idea of context, and because it's also focused on the use or intended use. Um, and I love that in the principle of design, it's about making experiences for people, well, at least some, a principle of design that some people embrace is this idea of, you know, if you have like a, I always remember when we switched, um, we switched can openers. Like we had this one can opener, it was like holding like, it was like really painful to use. It was, 
uh, had like two metal ends, you know, and it looked more like it was designed for uh, as a nutcracker than a can opener. And, and then we got this fancy, rounded, you know, ergonomic sort of thing. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but the, the, point, like, the point is that someone thought, okay, let's make this experience more pleasant, right? And so I think the question of choice is, again, like you can't do everything for everyone all the time. That's not, you know, that's impossible. But to be gonna think, okay, well, if I make a, if I make a can opener in this way, is there a slight modification I can make that would ex expand its, use, its usability for different people, right? Um, you know, and, and then at the same time, though, how can you do it with elegance and, and, and beauty if that's your intention or, or what you're hoping to accomplish? Or, or how can, even how could you make something, this is where I go back to the noise bit, how can you make something so ugly and so useless that it frustrates people and they get excited and design, design something better, you know? Like sometimes there's value in, in, there's value in disrupting and value in something that's difficult to use in the right context, I think, so. And disruption in and of itself, yeah. And I, so this is gonna, I'm not gonna go too far down this road, but there is, there is, there is a, and actually someone here knows the author's name, and I, because I'm gonna forget, I'm gonna ask him to tell me the author's name. The author of The Phenomena of Man, Pierre, Stuart, are you still in the audience? Yes, Deschardins, Pierre Deschardins. And this is gonna be totally out, outer bounds. This is gonna be disrupt, my disruption to you all. But he, his concept is that we're, we're evolving as a society to a, a higher shared consciousness. I mean, it's a little bit weird. I mean, it's very weird. And he has this whole thing that's called the new sphere, which is this sort of atmosphere of the collective consciousness. And uh, I gotta make sure I know where I'm trying to take this. Um, but this idea that, um, you know, are we, so that's sort of the question of progress. Are we moving to a place where there's a greater understanding and greater interaction? Are, are the, dis at some point, the disruptions become less and less needed? I don't know, I, my personal view, my personal sort of perspective on that is I think we're always gonna need disruptions. And, and there will be a point maybe where you get to one place and you get very satisfied in one place and then that needs to be disrupted, you know? So I, it's, that's a complex philosophical question. I actually did not take philosophy in college because the first day of class I got stung by a bee and I said, this is a bad sign. <laughs> So I dropped the class and I think I like transferred to a dance class or something. Yeah. So I don't think disruption needs to be antagonistic. That's really something I think is really important to acknowledge. Like when we did, when we did, and also I don't think you have to, I, I think it's a bad idea if you're entering into your motivation for disruption is to make people uncomfortable. That might be a, an outcome and that's okay. Um, or an output maybe. But I don't think that motivation should be like, I'm just gonna with them, you know, like, and so, because um, that, I mean, and I think there's some, I think there's some aspect to, to punk where it was, I mean, there are some, like, just, like, punk for the sake of just messing with people, but there's also, like, you know, for instance, like, like, Pussy Riot, for instance, their intention wasn't just to F with people, their intention was to call attention to something that needed to be called attention to, um, and so I think, like, that, 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 um, the, the motivation of disruption becomes a really important piece of that. Um, and so then how do you bring people into that uncomfortable place? If you're doing it in, in a way that's welcoming and inviting while being disruptive, people are far more likely to, to sort of come along with you even though they tre have trepidation or fear. Um, and so I, I remember one time we were doing this long noise show and uh, where was it? It was where... where uh, where Kurt Vonnegut is from in the coast of Oregon. Can't remember the name of the town. Any Kurt Vonnegut fans can remember. It starts with an A. Stor is this Storia? Somewhere, something like that. Anyways, on the coast of Oregon. And there was like three people there and we played for four hours to three people. But there, we couldn't help but notice there was this older woman, who probably like in her early 70s, who stayed the whole time. And I was like, well, either she can't hear <laughs> Um, or something else is going on. And uh, she came up to us after the show and she was just beaming and so excited. And she said, oh, I, that was so great. Thank you for doing that. Like, at first I just thought the amp was broken. And then, and then I just, but I, I just sat and I listened and I watched you guys do it. And I realized it was, you got, 
that oh, it was just so beautiful. And, uh, and I, the takeaway for me was like, people have a far greater tolerance for things that are different than what they're used to, but we don't give them the chance. We don't give them the permission and we don't give them the safety of doing it free of, of attack and antagonism. By welcoming people into that experience, it's amazing like the, the things that people, that open up for people if they're given that, that chance. And I think Indianapolis, this is just sort of a side note, but Indianapolis requires permission more than any place I've ever lived or been. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's actually exciting to me because if you say to someone, it's okay, you, c you can like this. People are like, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is pretty cool, yeah. I don't totally get it, but yeah, this is cool, that's great. And I think that's, I think that's part of that process. Yeah. Yeah, so I had a class, one of my, this is gonna either discredit me or credit me. I took a, a class in college called Seminar in Avant-Garde Performance. And there was six of us and this nutty professor. And uh, there, was these, uh, there was this individual in the class who I clashed with a lot. And I remember one day we were talking about self-awareness. Um, and this is going to be slightly controversial, but I, I say it, I think this will speak a little bit to what you're asking. And these people, th this, this young woman was talking about how um, self-awareness is what uh, you can't be, you need to, if you're self-aware, the value of self-awareness was like kind of a supreme value. Like if you knew yourself, then through that you could help others, right? And I was like, that is baloney. Like I could be an ass and totally know I'm an ass. Be completely aware of my assness. And so what's the value of that awareness? So what I was arguing for is other awareness. The only way to truly to sort of empathize is to truly know the other, not yourself. Because I don't believe you can know yourself. Um, I think, I think the only, and the only way you define yourself is often in comparison or in juxtaposition to other people. And so then there's this sort of this, this scale um, of sympathy, which is sort of looking at someone and saying, oh, that's too bad. Um, and there can be variations of that, right? And then there's empathy, which is like, wait, I see that in myself. Uh, wait a minute. Okay, let me enter into that space with you. But then I think there's one further step, which is compassion, which the, I think it's like the Greek word for compassion. I'm totally pulling this out, so if you, you Wikipedia and I'm wrong, just shout it out. But compassion is this, I think the word comes from something to do with the gut. And it's sort of this idea that you are feeling such a deep empathy that it compels you through the gut to act. So, I mean, because empathy doesn't necessarily mean action, right? But, but I think compassion is, a, is an active verb, not an emotion. Um, or this is the, I mean, I'm being, and this is semantics, right? But, but like, what is the, how are you compelled in that moment of empathy to act? And, and that to me is that sort of difference between we may never get that baseline and we could spend our whole life trying to find that baseline. That's where I feel like this idea of being other aware is, is, is sort, of the, sort of my response to that. Is that kind of? Yeah. You can stay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm, um, you can stay. You can stay. I don't think it's really just... Okay, okay. Um, I was probably swearing too much. <laughs> Anyways. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, impactful designs that, that address that. Um, um, it's a good question. I, I, um, I mean, there's there's examples. I, I mean, I think honestly, I think the the. I mean, this is maybe a little bit. I don't know. This is trite, but I think the Cultural Trail did a really good job in considering the crosswalks and the way the street. I and mean, that's more in a built environment. Uh, again, I, I think that what you see, it's interesting. I, there's actually environments that you can skateboard really well tend to also be very accessible environments and it it's not a just sort of a disruptive to pedestrian friendly environment um, um, and some of the most beautiful design public spaces are these zero transition sort of or i don't know if zero transition is the right term but these these spaces where you enter in them the the the, the edges are blurred 
It's not like, oh, all of a sudden I've arrived because I've stepped into this box. But that, that again, that is sort of, it, it, it works in concert and mutates with its borders, right? Um, I, other examples, I mean, I, I mean, there's all kinds of products I've seen that I feel like speak to that. Um, I think it's amazing what's being done right now in the, in the realm of prosthetics and, and how uh, there's this really great book. And when I told someone that I, rec I was recommending this, they're like, oh, that's so, such a book you would recommend. But there's a book called uh, The History of the Future in 100 Objects. And it's a sci-fi book talking about um, these 100 objects, like kind of taking up to like 2050 and like how it changes the world. And, they, and one of the objects is this javelin. I'm going to, let me just back up here a second. The point is, they're talking about in the future that prosthetic technology gets so advanced that the Paralympi Paralympics actually surpass the Olympics, and it's sort of this enhancement Olympics. And so the Olympics have to decide how they're going to respond. Um, it's, it's a fascinating story about this sort of, you know, this way, um, and, and I, I, have, I struggle with that a little bit, right? Because on one level, I think there's something really radical and beautiful about the way a person is unprotheticized or unassisted because we're often using prosthetics to make them work within our framework. So there's a tension there. Um, I don't know if I can say much more than that. Like, I, I think it, uh, that's, the, that's the intellectual challenge, that's the intellectual tension I think we're gonna be faced with for a long time. So, uh, yeah, over you and then you. You, oh, I didn't know if you, okay. Whatever, just someone. Okay, that's fair. That's what Q&A is about, advancing our own agendas. Go ahead. Yeah, I just, I just not, I'm not kind. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, makes it a lot easier. Uh, I, I'm fully aware of my assness is what I'm getting at. So, no, I, no you're, you raise a good point. And I think the, uh, you know, that idea of, um, I mean, I, I think that's what's wrong with a lot of, you know, um, sort of present day religious systems of the way that, and politics, yeah, which, or is there a difference? Um, uh, in the way that we think about how we're gonna help others, this idea of lifting up, this idea of, um, yeah, like the least of these is sort of, and, 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 and I think that's, you know, em in many ways empathy is like realizing, oh, you're right. I mean, honestly, it, it, is, it is a sense of that baseline of, Oh, I'm. I didn't. I, I didn't do this on my own. I was born into privilege. I, you know, I, I'm a white male and educated, and so. It, and and I like. I guess that's my point about we all have special needs. Like one one. Well, I remember when Atlas was really small, or like two years old, and we just kind of wrestling with some stuff. I like. I went up to my wife. I was like, Wait a minute. Atlas is not broken. We're broken. Um. So I. I yes. You do, you do need to go on that journey to understand who you are and how you, and there's a great quote, we fear in others that which we most, most fear in ourselves. I forget who said it, so I'm just gonna credit to Lincoln. Um, but that's a trick. If you ever quote anything, you don't know who said it, just say Lincoln or Orson Welles. Or not Orson Welles, H, no, wait, who's the other Welles? Uh, Orson, who's the guy like said, like I won't be a part of a club that would have me as part? Huh? Oscar Wilde, that's the one, sorry. Oscar Lincoln Wilde. Um, so, so I think, I think um, where was I going with that? Yes, I agree with you. I, I think that's a ten the tension, though. Like, you can spend all this time trying to figure out yourself and enter into this place of sort of self full self-awareness, and you miss the person sitting next to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and as far as your question about, like, exhibiting, you know, like, how are the tools for kindness sort of thing. Um, you know, it's hard. I mean, I think, I think, you know, it's really hard to be in a place. This is, it hasn't happened to me a lot. That's one of the things I like about living in Indianapolis, to be honest. I feel like Indianapolis does a really, really good job when it comes to uh, understanding differently abled folks of all varieties. Um, we don't always do the best job with other types of populations. Um, but I do think, I, th I think there is a culture of, of embrace as it relates to that. And, and so, so one, um, I, I do remember early on we were at, we were at some place in public and, and, you know, walking around and I remember like someone just like really staring at us and it hasn't happened that often, but it did happen in this one particular case and I got so mad. I was just like, it's like, look at you, you know, like, 
what's your problem? <laughs> um, but you know, it's like, they, it's, just, it's a new, it's a disruption, like I said. And, they're, and so either my response is to be antagonistic and to be, you know, like really standoffish or, or to be like, do you, wanna, do, you, do you wanna meet him? Do you wanna, get the, you wanna enter into this place with me? I welcome you. Like, I, I'm, I can't judge you because this is not your experience, you know? And I don't know what your experience has been. And, and so another side of this, when I was, I had a cousin who was um, severely, uh, he, had a, he had a series of strokes at three years old and was se uh, severely mentally handicapped um, and um, was very violent. And uh, we, I don't know what, I don't know what my parents were thinking, but would often let us play by ourselves. And, and they would often say like, oh, like Paul, you know, like, give Michael a kiss. And he, one time he bit me really, really bad. I mean, and so, and so I, I grew up with a fear of, of people that I saw visibly having a cognitive um, or, you know, disability. And, and so um, that was really hard for me. And, and even to, up until before Atlas, like I, that was my experience. And so, you know, if you have a negative experience, it, it takes far longer to heal a wound than it does to inflict one. And a lot of us, all of us have been wounded in some way, right? And, and so we have our wounds and we, we don't want more damage or more harm. And if there's a particular type of person or, tip, tip, or a particular experience that we had that caused that harm, we're gonna avoid that. And, and probably that's just survival response and some of that's okay, some of that's fine. But, but then also I think, again, getting back to that baseline or getting back to that place in us, trying to understand where that response is coming from I think is really important. There was a question way in the back. Yeah, no, come. Oh, I said I was gonna go to you, I'm sorry. Oh, we'll just, sorry, can we wait on you just a sec? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Well, who's your boss? That's okay. Um, maybe I know them. Uh, I, I mean, I think some of it's leading by example, and, 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 and also I think it's important to know that, like, you kind of have to choose your battles. Um, we all need advocates for different people, and, and, we, and so, you know, you'd get exhausted trying to, 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 to do that for everyone and for, um, but I think, I think it comes from starting, you know, I know I keep kind of contradicting myself, but I think it begins to sort of be mo modeling it in yourself and, uh, you know, and calling people out. Like, I, like, don't let anyone use the word retard. There is no reason we need to use that word. It is antiquated. It, is ne it was never appropriate. And I still even like struggle, like you heard me switch between differently abled and disabled. Like that's, I, I struggle with how to best articulate that. But you know, that, that and, and you know, I've probably even let that word slip before. But I think in the workplace, if you hear something, I think, you, I think it's time for us to start calling that out. You know, I mean, it, it just, but in a way, again, that's not antagonistic or, or, or punishing or, or unnecessarily confrontational. It's like, hey, you know what? Like, and, and it's not in front of other people. I mean, it's pulling them aside and saying, you know, when you say that word, it makes me feel really uncomfortable, and I don't think it's fair, you know, and I, I just, you know, like, I don't want to upset you, and I, I, you know, if you say it tomorrow, it, you know, I'm not going to think anything less of you, but I just, I would, I think we need to make people aware of the words they use, because words are powerful. So I think in the workplace, that's where I imagine a lot of that application happening. And just challenging people on that. So yeah, I don't know how, it's difficult, yeah. Get a better boss, yeah. <laughs> Way in the back. I mean, again, I, I, think, I think empathy and criticism are two different things. I, 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 I think that's a fair point. I mean, so if I was, like, kind of going back to the challenging my kids and the, the, what I put them through from a therapy standpoint, like, I, you know, we stick our son with a needle in his chest every week. I don't think that's too soft on him. You know, we're trying to make him survive. And so I do think they're, you know, again, in the workplace, you know, it's like you could be super empathetic and be like, well, that's just how they are. Um, I'm not advocating for, for no confrontation. I'm advocating for confrontation that comes from a place of, of empathy as opposed to a place of anger. Um, and so... 
Are we too soft as a nation? Uh, fuck that, man. Donald Trump is not an incredibly empathetic person. Uh, I, I think I, I would much rather err on the side of empathy than I would on... Um, on a harsh standard to, 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 to get ahead or to, I, I know, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I, I, and I think, I think there, again, that's the tension, right? The tension of challenging us to be the best versions of ourselves. And you, we could all have different definitions of what that is. And that's where this whole talk gets very challenging and complicated. This is not a, this is not a solution workshop, <laughs> but, but, um, I don't know. I, I think we still have, I still think we could err a little bit more on empathy. So, yeah. I agree. Empathy is hard work. Sympathy is easy. So what you're seeing and what you're talking about, I completely agree. Because I think sympathy actually cuts the legs out underneath from action. So we satisfy ourselves and we sit in sympathy and we actually don't do anything because we think sympathy is enough. And that's sort of what my point of like sort of the self-awareness piece was like, I sympathize with you, and that, and through my sympathy for you, I'm making the world better. Like that, no, no, I, I, I that's, that, I, so that maybe is a good dis way of thinking about that distinction. We probably are all done, right? All right, oh, one more question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, so, um, so for the last four plus years, I worked um, for Health and Hospital Corporation on the new Eskenazi Hospital Project. And my job was all the, all the squishy stuff. It was the art pro, well, that's, it, I didn't think it was squishy, but other people think it's squishy. Um, it was the art program, the music program, the rooftop farm, uh, some of the garden spaces, some of the design decisions, um, but also sort of our outward facing, how are we telling our story? What, how through telling our story can we actually make a difference in our community? Um, you know, we're a public hospital. So for those of you who don't know the history of Eskenazi, uh, you know, we used to be Wishard. Before that, we were the city hospital. And we're over 150 years old. And we've always been the hospital where if you don't have insurance, you come to us. Um, or if you're shot or stabbed, you come to us because we're level one trauma. But the, the uh, so very much so. I mean, I think my, having spent time in the hospital before having this job at the hospital, I was able to, to empathize because I had been in that situation. I had been vulnerable in a hospital situation with our son and know what it's like to have to, to be in that context. And so I wanted to create an environment that wasn't, sympath wasn't just sympathetic. It wasn't all pillows and sort of scented candles, um, but it was a place where people could be inspired and a little bit challenged. I mean, some of the art in the hospital, I don't think it's antagonistic, but there's, you know, there's some abstract kind of bold art. Most, most uh, hospital art sort of journals will say, do a landscape painting. Um, that's because most of those people who are writing those articles are actually vendors <laughs> that sell landscape paintings. Um, but, but, you know, we were still sensitive to the context. So in the hospital tower, we do have more natural landscapes and we have lots of, you know, windows and, um, but, you know, in the clinic side, in the, the day of service, you know, we put more abstract, more bold, more um, things of that nature. And so, yeah, I think it very much continues to inform. I, I, I don't think I'd ever tell my boss that I'm running it as a performance art piece, but but I, there is an aspect to which I think about, hey, this is life. People are coming through here. This is a very vulnerable place when people are in this part of, um, in, in here in their life. And how can that experience be something that doesn't, doesn't sympathize, but empathizes and creates an environment that's, that's healing and inviting and inspiring and aspirational? And I, I, I think we did a pretty good job of that. And if you haven't been out to the campus, I hope you, I hope you get a chance to come out. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate your questions and your time.